Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to talk about The Wheel of Time Season 1. So in this review, it's going to be some spoilers, but mostly non-spoiler. But we're going to kind of do just a gener general kind of thoughts on the first season of The Wheel of Time. I'm not going to go super detailed. We'll probably go into more detail later on when I start to speculate about what could happen in Season 2. So, as always, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And let's begin. So, The Wheel of Time Season 1. We finally got The Wheel of Time. It's so cool to have one of these awesome, huge fantasy series adapted. And we get to actually finally talk about it. Like, we get to fully talk about the first season in full. Even though the first season's production was a bit bumpy with some COVID stuff happening and with the loss of one of our main actors, I still think the show generally, like, handled those issues pretty well. And kind of, I mean, I guess I'll say stuck the landing, but it wasn't like a perfect tan landing or anything like that. But first of all, I want to talk about the world building. I want to talk about the way the show was able to present parts of this world in such a way that feels really organic, to me at least. I think the presentation of the two rivers was really, really well done. Some of the production value of it was a little off. Like I said in the first episode or so, it feels like the dirt and stuff on the ground was just entirely too clean. So some of that kind of comes across as clearly as a set. But I really like how the village felt very established and stuff. We could kind of tell, like, the dynamics of the people, like with the women's circle and stuff. And then how Matt was interacting with everyone and how the rest of the characters interacted with each other. So it just kind of came across really well to me. I, like, I really got a good feel of, like, where they were from, their village, and, like, the kind of the origin of our main characters kind of thing. I really got a real solid feel for that. So I really like that a lot. And similar with um, other locations, like we're just traversing the world and stuff. Like some of those locations they chose where they were just kind of like sitting around when they were um, having that conversation when where uh, Moraine basically implied she was just going to leave without them and stuff. So that location itself was really, really cool. And I imagine it's a real place over in Europe because, you know, why would they build that and, like, have those specific type rock structures if it's, you know, I mean, it's not totally relevant to the story. It's just kind of a cool setting. So it definitely has to be somewhere natural in real life. So I thought that was just a really cool set location that they managed to get. And it kind of lends itself to everywhere they go feels ancient but also lived in. So, like, the establishing shots and stuff they show where you see the skyscrapers overgrown with vegetation and stuff like that i just really really like that stuff because i think that's one of the coolest parts of the wheel of time like as i get further and further in the series like we get a lot of um information of, well not a lot of information but we get a lot more indication of that kind of stuff and like the nature of the fact that this world the story takes place in a far future and not like a far past or anything like that so i'm just happy that a lot of that stuff came across similar with faldara and the way that entire city looks and stuff. Like, granted, yes, a lot. I mean, it's supposed to be pretty deserted all around, all around the city and stuff. But it comes across really well. At least in episode, what, um, seven? It comes across really, really well. But in episode eight, it's clear that that's where the production stuff started to happen. Because, like, the scene where, um, where Nynaeve and Egwene and the other women go off to go channel and, like, fight the Trollocs or whatever. And they just kind of walk in off. Um, screen like you can totally tell they couldn't be in that same location that they were in for the previous episode and they look like they're on a set and stuff so you can really tell that but like in the moment I kind of immediately gave it the benefit of the doubt because I realized that they were going to try to make up for it with the CGI spectacle it kind of worked it kind of did and I'm kind of I'm very mixed on a lot of it that's why I think my ranking video is going to have to be separate because I actually have to do a lot of thinking about that the way I want to break it down because I basically only have three episodes I could even say are like my top three so I got it because everything else kind of melds together so we got to kind of go into more detail on that later but in general I really do have to say I do appreciate the world building I love what they deal with the IEL I know it's a little extra I guess to have a woman literally in um labor <laughs> like just kicking ass but to me that feels like something totally possible for the IEL to do based on your skill level and stuff even though it's explained in the books culturally that that wouldn't even be going on but as a method to show don't tell and like show how cool the IO fighters are and like show how badass they are, I think that worked out really well. And I kind of, I liked it. I, I dug it totally. And the entire scene was cool. Like there's some editing stuff in it that's a little wonky. Like there's just, all over the season, there's different places where the editing is goofy to me. There's, um, 
there's clips and things that cause like continuity and time issues and stuff. And that's just, I don't know if that has to do with also like production issues or if those are just natural mistakes. But those are some things that are in there. But to me, they honestly weren't so much that it took me out of the show. As you can see from like my episode to episode review, I was pretty much digging most of everything I saw. So I still really did like it, even though there was some, definitely some stuff that I noticed. I'm not going to say that it was totally perfect, but it was definitely there. So let's go ahead and talk about the characters. So the characters are like where my biggest highs and biggest lows are. So some of the best parts of the show is the acting. They managed to get a cast that was really, really well, like really, really skilled. Like the actors do a really good job in trying to bring these characters forth. But I don't think we got enough time with any of them. We didn't get any real proper time to develop the dynamics between the characters and like the interplay off them and the different relationships and all that stuff. We try to get some hints of it and stuff. They work on it and like especially was the episode seven where we basically get the true reveal of Perrin having a crush on Egwene, like that whole confrontation. That's the most character interaction we had since they were at the White not the White Spring, at the um well when they were basically back home before everything started happening. That's like the closest to like sitting down, calm down character interaction we got. And it just it annoyed the crap out of me because I do not like that plot line. Like I love Marcus's uh, Marcus Rutherford um, acting and stuff, and I love like a lot of the actors acting a lot. But some of the stuff they did with the characters, the, uh, as far as the writing standpoint, kind of you know it takes me back. It becomes a negative because the changes they made to parents so far, I think, is going to have some interesting ramifications down the line. But. I really like the extra stuff they gave Marcus to play on because we really got to see his acting through a lot of those extra things. But I'm still very apprehensive about the in, uh, the implied changes that that'll have to create down the line. So I'm, I'm so of two minds about a lot of it. And Barney Harris, like him as Matt, I think he is probably one of the best examples of, despite having very little screen time and not a whole lot of you know um, space to grow and like to explore the character, that is still an actor who was able to embody the character almost immediately. And I think it came across so, so well. So that's another reason why I'm really disappointed he won't be in season two. But he's also one of the reasons why the production probably got really weird towards the end because apparently he left production like very abruptly. So they had to kind of scramble to deal with it. So I think that kind of explains some of the weird interactions in the final episode, like with Perrin dealing with Pat on Fane, which doesn't make any sense contextually. So that's probably really the explanation for a lot of that. Also, Nynaeve. I love the way um, the character Nynaeve is portrayed, but she is significantly different from the books, which is pretty much okay with me because, as I've said before in plenty of um, book reviews and stuff, I don't care for the way Nynaeve treats other characters. I don't care for her personality in the book a lot. She's very abrasive and very, like, she's just mean. She just comes across as mean for, like, no reason a lot of the times, and I don't like it. But I like the way that it was kind of translated in the show that she's just like stubborn and like hyper protective of her people from Emmonsfield and stuff like that. So it kind of comes off as this like acerbic kind of overly harsh type personality in a way. So I just I really like that adjustment to her and like I really appreciate that. And Moraine is is very she's she's different from the books, but I feel like she more Rosamund Pike is like more embodying the Moraine that shows up later the kind of developed um, version of Moraine I feel like but some of her decisions and stuff based on the writing and all that is really wonky and I don't think the Moraine from the books would have done it because I think she she just I clearly has so much more information and so much more intelligent about all of that stuff that's going on so the way in which Rosamund Pike's Moraine go about it she feels less informed than from the books so that's kind of a negative but it feels almost natural because in the show they kind of explain it with her interactions with Swan and stuff. So it feels like, yes, it was a bit of a misstep, but it's also a justified misstep because it's clearly a part of what they were trying to do. So I can accept it on that level. I don't know. I feel like I have like every negative I have, I'm almost trying to give it an excuse or an explanation. But like I like to give a lot of this kind of stuff the benefit of the, of the doubt because for one, this is season one. These all these actors are new to this and like the writing and stuff kind of has to hit his stride and everything And you know, of course the production issues that they had because of COVID and because of actors and stuff like that So 
I'm trying to give definitely season one the benefit of the doubt because I think the show shows so much great potential going forward. I think some of the changes that they imply, which um, like the end of the first season could either be a pull from a later book or a change to stuff that happens in the second book. So there's like, there's just so much room for playing around and adjustments and just different kind of, um, you know, adaptation points to make really. And I'm just really happy that we actually are seeing that happen. But some of them, I'm like, eh, don't do that. Don't change that. Like, let's keep that. Let's, let's let's keep that dynamic the way it's supposed to be. Similar to the way the season ends with Ishimayo. Ishim the, the way it's presented is very much presented as Ran is going up against the Dark One. Like, that is uh, Shaitan or whatever. And in the books, we know it's not. And I think the show kind of implies it's not as well. But I don't think it came across as clearly because... Previous to that, we only get one character mentioning the Forsaken at all. and But he does mention the Shemayo, so I feel like that's kind of supposed to be our hint. But I don't think there was nearly enough, you know, backstory, like, talked about it or anything. Like, they should have, like, when they um, found out the Trollocs and stuff for real, I wish there would have been some more exposition about, like, oh, my God, Trollocs are real. This isn't just a story. So does that mean, like, the Forsaken could be real and stuff like that? And, like, them just having, like, panicky kind of question conversations with Moraine and probably would have found out more about those different um, people and stuff like that. I mean, I feel like that would have been better foreshadowing. But considering they didn't do much with the fact that he is a Forsaken means that maybe that wasn't truly necessary. So I don't know. It's like there's a lot of stuff that I, I continue to try to give the benefit of the doubt. Because I did overall truly enjoy the season. I think it was really well done. I have some really, really, um, sh there's some really strong points to certain episodes that I really, really love. And there's some stuff in those same episodes where I'm like, ah. Like, I really like the episode where kind of Perrin goes like full wolf brother and stuff. Like, in eyes, his eyes glow and stuff. But I really don't like the fact that there's no Elias. There's no proper introduction to the concept of wolf brothers. Like, I don't like that his eyes only glow in situations of anger or whatever. I, I like the, they should be just gold all the time. I just really want that. Um, I don't like the fact that they're clearly going with this idea of Perrin being able to control the wolves more than communicate with them and being on an equal footing with them. I don't really like that. And I'm very sensitive to, like, werewolf type things. So that's one of the things I'm going to really pay attention to. So I think overall, I'm going to have to give the season something like a 6.5, maybe a 7 out of 10. The There's a lot of really good stuff in here, but there's some um, downgrades that are really worth knocking it off a few points. But I think, like, as I said already, there is so much great potential in this show. And I love the way it ends because it implies we're going to go real full hog into the world building in season two. And I just really, really hope they get more episodes so that we can get better and more complete character interaction so we can see the dynamics and stuff. Like, I read online that they actually had to fight to, like, get that Manetherin song and that entire scene to stay in the show because they thought it was just too exposition-y and, like, wanted to cut it out. Like, stuff like that, I really love that kind of stuff. It's really contextually important to the world, and it's very reminiscent of the way Robert Jordan kind of writes his exposition and stuff. We just kind of sit there and talk about it and just learn this stuff. So I think it's really appropriate for the show, and it worked really well from a directorial standpoint. I didn't get bored in that scene or anything like that. So I really do encourage them to do some more stuff like that where, where it is appropriate and do it in a way that, you know, is contextually appropriate, similar to the way they did with Manethrin. It made sense to tell that story while they were walking or while they were on the horses and stuff. So I just want more of that. I want more episodes next season. Like, let's hopefully we can get like 10 episodes for next season and get some real good character interaction, some good character development. Because I really hope they kind of lean into that because we have the replacement for Matt. And based on the trajectory of where his story is going to go now, I think we really need to kind of get to know that new actor and see how he embodies Matt. So I just, I, I just hope we get a lot more of everything. I guess that's kind of my ultimate opinion of it. I just want more. I want more, and I want better writing, and I want a bigger budget. Because um, rewatching uh, these episodes on my TV instead of my computer, I kind of really started to notice the stuff people have been saying online about the CGI. Some of the CGI does not hold up when you're closer to the TV. I was like, oh, okay, this is what this is what the internet was talking about. And, but some of it was, like, really wonky. But some of it's, like, really, really good. Like, I, I can't get over, like, the... Um, in the last episode when um, the Dark One or Shamayo like, does the arrow through the eye. It's a really cool effect, and it's a really cool moment. 
But seeing it up close, like seeing it closer to the TV and stuff, boy, that CGI was not ready to go. That needed more time and rendering. But yeah, so I really, as I said again, I'm just going to keep repeating that at this point because this whole review is a total stream of consciousness. We're going to go into more detail in my ranking video where I can actually go into the reasons why I like, you know, particular episodes and stuff like that. And that will probably, well, that and then my season two speculation video, which will probably come a little bit later. That'll probably be the majority of my TV show coverage for The Wheel of Time. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. Let me know in the comments down below, what did you all think about season one? Overall, overall thoughts. Did you think it came together really well despite the production issues and stuff? Did you think the characters and the acting kind of came together cohesively? How did you feel about the storylines? Did you did you think it kind of, it was smooth or was it really bumpy for you? Let me know about that in the comments down below. So as always, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And I will talk to you all next time. Peace.